And I'm the Sonoma State Director of the Center for Environmental Inquiry. Uh, we have a collaboration with the Water Agency called the Waters Collaborative, where we train students uh, in with with high impact educational ex, uh, educational experiences by helping them address the real world questions that are ongoing in water uh, water management questions. So I'm just going to frame uh, our discussion today a little bit, um, setting the stage for our three speakers and to help moderate the session. So here's. Here's a little introduction to where we're going on within this sustainable water session. So, as we all know, uh, water is the foundation of everything we do. If you look around this room, everything that you see is made with water. It's the universal solvent. And actually, if you look outside, the whole landscape is created by water. And not only that, the majority of the rocks that you see are made with water. So, we really are living in a water culture, a water world that we, we don't often think about. And then we know that California is unusual in the United States with regard to water. California has the largest year-to-year -year variation in precipitation than anywhere in the United States. And that's our, our, our annual precipitation varies between 50% and 200% of our long-term average. And that's because we have a Mediterranean climate. We have a short season where the water falls and a, and, a, and a season, longer season, where the water does not fall. And during that wet season, we get a few storms that give the majority of our water. So if we get one storm shorter or one storm more, that can account for this huge variability in rainfall. So California has been dealing with these issues in water shortages and water gluts for its history. And you can relate some of this boom-bust cycle to our development on the landscape. And when water gets short, we end up pitting our different areas of our community against each other. So we have the fisheries, the industry, the agriculture, even the energy communities and organizations all grabbing, <laughs> all competing for a limited resource. And I just want to share a, a personal experience with you, something that just brought home to me the importance of water for where we develop. So we're currently, our programs are growing. We have a number of these collaborations with businesses, and we're getting students involved. And we're now building new facilities at our preserve in southern Mendocino County, the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve. It's going to be great. We're going to have these buildings where students can now study water and have that firsthand experience and those really uh, motivational transformations. So um, my personal experience was very simple. We were told by a consultant that we might not have any water. So what we could do at the site and how far our programs would grow was completely limited by this resource. It's, it's clear. You can't build there if you don't have the water. And luckily, through a combination of rainwater and some well water that we got, we will be creating these programs. And if anybody would like to join us in this initiative, we're very happy to talk about it. So um, with water, we know that climate change is only going to add to these challenges. And I love this quote from Paul Dickinson, the CEO of the Carbon Disclosure Project. He says, if climate change is the shark, then water is its teeth. It's really central to our issues. And in our area, there's some uncertainty about how precipitation is going to change. Some models predict more rainfall. Some models predict less rainfall although most of these models agree that we can expect a change. So we know our boom-bust cycle is likely to change. And small changes in each one of those storms can have drastic effects. So to remain resilient, we really need to start looking at that issue of water availability. We need to find new ways to store water and we have to find new ways to reuse and conserve the water that we're actually using. And these two things will be instrumental in making us resilient to whatever changes occur in the future and also help us to reduce conflicts regarding the changes that happen now. 
Um, so today we're going to hear from speakers who are at the forefront of finding new solutions. We have Marcus Trotta on the far, in the far left, right, from the Sonoma County Water Agency, and he's going to be speaking to us about new ideas for storing water without building dams and reservoirs. And we have two speakers who are going to be talking about techniques and approaches for recycling wastewater and actually for using that water for bioenergy production. And that's Baji Goburi here from Cambrian Innovation and Mike Cohen, who is a professor at Sonoma State in the middle. So with that, let me introduce Marcus first, um, give you a little background, and he's going to talk for about 10 minutes or so about these um, new solutions that the water agency is coming up with. Marcus specializes in groundwater recharge, monitoring, management, and research. His role includes investigating the interaction and exchange of surface water and groundwater. He's a California professional geologist and certified hydrogeologist and received his Bachelor of Science degree in geology with an emphasis in hydrologic science from the University of California at Davis. Thank you, Marcus. Great, thank you, Claudia. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, so I'm going to give just a, a really brief overview first of some of uh, the groundwater uh, resource studies and, and management planning efforts that the water agency has been involved with, along with many other uh, local partners in our communities, in terms of, uh, of initiatives that sustain our groundwater resources. I think it's important to have that that context before we really start to think about and, uh, and contemplate storing groundwater in our, storing water in our, in our aquifers. Um, and I'm gonna focus on some of these solutions that have been recommended by uh, local stakeholders and, and try and focus uh, on, on those, uh, those storage, not just the aquifer storage, but other, other uh, initiatives that can help sustain our groundwater resources because Sustaining our groundwater resources is not only going to be needed for our local economy, our local ecosystems, our local uh, rural residential well owners. It's also a new mandate by the state. A, a new law was passed that went into effect last year statewide that requires um, local groundwater, local agencies to sustainably manage their groundwater resources, or the state will now have the authority to step in and, and do it for us. And, and most, most folks in our local communities would rather manage our, our water resources locally because we're oftentimes the, the folks that, that know those resources best. And so I um, just wanted to make sure you're aware of that, that context. Um, let's see where we are. Okay, great. So before, um, get into that, I just want to give a brief overview of, of kind of where groundwater fits into the hydrologic cycle um, to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, groundwater does not occur in underground uh, rivers or lakes. The groundwater moves very slowly underground through the uh, cracks and fissures between rocks and, and sand and gravel pore spaces. Um, it uh, starts out as, as rainfall, precipitation that falls on the ground. Some of that uh, rainfall runs off to the nearest stream. Some of it ev is evaporated back up into the atmosphere. Some of it infiltrates and is sucked up by the roots of plants and then evapotranspired back into the atmosphere. What doesn't do one of those uh, things infiltrates into our groundwater aquifers, and this diagram shows that. And it, that occurs in, in groundwater recharge areas, so we call that groundwater recharge, and it recharges our groundwater aquifers and then moves underground. Oftentimes, this can take decades to centuries to thousands of years before it finally reaches what we call a discharge area, which is often a, a lake or a stream or a wetland. And many of our, our streams and wetlands here are fed by groundwater, and so groundwater plays a really important role in our ecosystems. Um, this diagram also shows two different types of aquifers, an unconfined aquifer, which is the shallowest aquifer that's usually connected with those streams. And then we also have deeper confined aquifers that are generally underneath clay layers or some other impermeable layer that are under pressure. And they're both uh, really important components of the aquifer systems. So next slide. So the, the Water Agency has been involved in studying our groundwater resource here in the county for about a decade and a half now. We initiated a, a program with the U.S. Geological Survey along with uh, many other local 
local cities and, and water districts that helped fund these programs. And uh, it's, it's involved the, the characterization of, of four of the more larger and more developed groundwater basins in the county. And those are shown on this diagram here. Uh, the Alexander Valley shown in yellow and, and Sonoma Valley were the first two basins that uh, had their studies completed back in about 2006. Uh, the Santa Rosa Plain was the largest of the, of the three basins. That study was completed in 2014. And then we, we just initiated a study uh, two years ago in the Petaluma Valley, and that's an ongoing study that's anticipated to be completed in uh, 2017. And uh, the, the goal of these studies is really to better integrate our surface water and groundwater supplies to help us build a more resilient um, water system. You can see the, 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 the lines that, that's on that map is actually the water agency's aqueduct. Most of the water that, that we supply to folks is from the Russian River system. And so you can see that our aqueduct overlies those groundwater basins, so there's, there's a, a, a connection between those different sources of water. And so in these studies, kind of the, the, the approach to these studies has been to gather all the available data that's out there in the groundwater basins, compile that, and then collect some new data to develop what's called a conceptual model of the groundwater basin. And that's what this um, diagram is attempting to show. This is uh, actually a cross-section across the uh, Santa Rosa Plain groundwater basin. If you can imagine slicing it in half, kind of pretty much where we're at here in Rona Park and lifting it up and looking at it uh, from the side, this is what uh, the geologists think it would roughly look like. And there's uh, kind of four main um, uh, geologic units that uh, the groundwater flows through. There's a shallow um, aquifer that's shown in yellow. That's mostly sand and gravel deposits. And that, that aquifer is really closely connected with our streams and wetlands. Uh, there's the Wilson Grove formation that underlies uh, most of the Sebastopol area. That's one of the more uh, permeable and higher producing aquifers that we have in, in Sonoma County. The Petaluma formation underlies most of the, uh, the Santa Rosa Plain. It has a lot of clay, but because it's so large, it actually does uh, produce a lot of groundwater in the area. And then the Sonoma Volcanics, which make up the hills to the east here, um, also uh, represent aquifers in some areas. And this diagram just shows how groundwater moves primarily from recharge areas on the, uh, the eastern side of the basin towards the west and discharges into the laguna. That's the, the general flow pattern. That flow pattern is disrupted both by fault zones that can form barriers to groundwater flow, as well as uh, water wells that, that can change the patterns of how groundwater moves through the basin. And so some, some other um, issues that have uh, been revealed by some of these studies, as well as ongoing monitoring that has happened after the studies have been completed are shown in this, this map. This is Southern Sonoma Valley, where we have a pretty robust uh, program of monitoring uh, water levels and wells. And this shows uh, water level hydrographs for deep zone wells. These are wells that are generally greater than 200 feet deep. And so most of these wells represent the confined deeper aquifer system. And in southern Sonoma Valley, we're seeing a pretty large area where groundwater levels have been declining at a, an unsustainable pace, declining at on the order of you know, several feet to, to four feet per year in some areas. And this is of concern because if that continues, you can have uh, people losing, uh, their, their wells can go dry. There's also uh, higher saline water to the south, and that can move in to our freshwater aquifers if, if this isn't addressed. And so as these issues have, have, uh, have come up um, that, that were revealed by the, by the USGS study, the Water Agency, along with our other partners, um, initiated in a voluntary groundwater management planning process where we brought together diverse uh, group of stakeholders, agricultural representatives, um, environmental groups, uh, rural well owners, to develop groundwater management plans to set up programs to, to better monitor the, the basins and come up with some solutions to address these issues. And uh, two um, plans were developed, one in Sonoma Valley and one in the Santa Rosa Plain. And these are some of the components that are in those plans. Um, they all kind of center around the importance of better monitoring and modeling, better understanding our groundwater basin. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, monitoring that goes into those plans. Involving, continuing to involving all the stakeholders, um, protecting groundwater, not just groundwater quality, but also protecting some of the natural recharge areas is a, is a component of those, those plans. Um, promoting water reuse, recy recycling 
uh, uh, highly treated water to offset groundwater pumping is an important program. And then groundwater recharge that I'll, I'll get into a little bit further here. Improving conservation and efficiency. Um, the, the urban areas have pretty strong conservation programs, but there really aren't any conservation programs that are available for most rural well owners in, in the region. And then integrating planning better, any better integrating land use planning with our groundwater resource planning. So uh, there's uh, multiple scales that um, uh, solutions can be implemented at, um, starting with just the, the rural well owner, rural landowner, just a better understanding the importance of groundwater and why it's important to conserve it. Better maintaining your water well can help protect groundwater resources. Um, water efficiency, efficiency and conservation. Uh, there's rainwater harvesting. There's a lot of programs out here that, that are, are run by the cities as well as the county to, to promote capturing rainwater and, and to, to help offset, offset potable water use. Um, gray water systems are also um, now getting more prevalent and there's, there's uh, specs out for those. And then just measuring and recording hydrologic data, we have a, a large network of, of voluntary uh, landowners that, that provide data to us so we can better understand our, our groundwater basin. So one of the, um, uh, two of the larger type of, of projects I wanna, I wanna talk about that get into groundwater recharge, one is combining stormwater management with groundwater recharge. And this can take, you know, kind of a variety of flavors looking at uh, doing things along creek beds to kind of spread out the flow so you're not just channelizing all your stormwater flow. Doing those types of projects in areas where we have permeable soils that that, that water that's spread out can ha help recharge our groundwater basin. Um, there's interest in, in on-farm on recharge as well. There's, there's a lot of agricultural areas throughout the state that are experimenting with flooding their ag fields in the winter if, if the uh, crops are appropriate so that they can recharge um, their aquifer supplies. Um, it's really important for any kind of medium to large scale uh, project on, on this order to do site-specific studies to make sure that you're not causing any problems in terms of, of water quality or other issues. And uh, last slide. So, and then an, another um, uh, initiative that, that we're looking at is what we call aquifer storage and recovery. And this is looking at utilizing uh, wintertime water from the Russian River when we have plenty of water in the Russian River utilizing that drinking water and conveying it uh, to our groundwater basins through our existing pipeline and recharging it through wells and basically using the aquifer as kind of a, an underground reservoir so that we have that water stored for times of drought or to help us meet peak summertime's demands. And, and so we're working on actually getting a, a pilot program off the ground uh, later this year in, with the city of Sonoma. Um, and uh, to, we want to do these projects in kind of a phased manner, start out small, study it to make sure that, that we're not causing any problems and then look at, at the appropriate way to scale those up. And so I'm um, happy to talk about that further as we get into the, uh, the panel discussion, but just want to reiterate there's a, a wide variety of projects that can be done to help sustain our groundwater resources. And, uh, and again, happy to talk more about them in the panel. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Marcus. Our next speaker is Baji Goburi. He is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Cambrian Innovation Incorporated. He has over two decades of leadership in water and clean energy industry. Uh, he works um, by developing Cambrian's customer pipeline and leads business development globally. Previously, he directed business and product development at Energy Recovery Incorporation and held various global management positions at General Electric, Water and Process Technologies. He earned his MBA from Chicago's Booth School of Business and has an MS in Hazardous Waste Management from Wayne State University. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks, Claudia. All right, let's see if this works. Uh, <coughs> nope. One less thing to hold on to. Sorry guys, I you know I'm enjoying the allergy season, so so I've been eating ricolas and whatnot. So anyway, so my topic would be more on the industrial side of it, right? I can touch on multiple sides of it. Uh, I won't go too far into the desalination side, but mostly on the industrial wastewater reuse uh, side of the business. So if you could please. <coughs> One of the things, first thing, when we talk about water and reusing water and everything, right, the first thing I want to point out is when we say water, 
It comes with energy. If you look at it, 20% of California's energy footprint is somehow or the other linked to water. So when I say let's save water, a gallon of water saved also involves a certain amount of energy saved, and that means, you know, if you're using fossil fuel to get that source of energy, you can see the implications, right? I mean, so it, it's something to keep in mind. I won't touch on the energy portion as much, but it always should be on the back of people's mind. When they let that water drip and waste, it's costing a lot of energy and the greenhouse gases associated, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to put that slide out there primarily because it's 20%, I and mean, look at that, 48 terawatt hours of, you know, per year. So that's a big, big, big number. So next slide, please. So then another, staying at a very high level, I, how many of you guys have seen this, the NASA? You know, NASA got into this whole, we're gonna measure groundwater levels. Like, what, what, what are you talking about? Groundwater levels for NASA, turns out they figured out a, a phenomenal way of measuring the changes in the groundwater levels. And what, was, what came out of it is right there at the bottom, a third of the world's largest groundwater basins are distressed. Right? You know, Mike talked about uh, groundwater recharge, et cetera. So there is a huge, you don't see it, right? You see the ocean levels going up, rivers flooding, et cetera. I have no idea what the groundwater level did below us right now, right? Most likely it's distressed. So it's something to think about, right? So, so there's two ways to solve the water crisis, supply side and demand side, basics of economics. Supply side, get more water from where? Right? Desalination is one of the commonly touted solutions. It's a part of an equation, not the solution, all of it. Then the other side is on the demand side of it. One way we can do is maybe use that drop of water more than once. Right now, every drop of water gets used once. Right? You get it, you use it, you flush it. So can we, can we figure out a way to reuse it? And therefore, you suppress the demand, you figure out a way to increase the supply, therefore get that imbalance and this distress situation to be normalized a little bit. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so when I talked about, you know, you get it and you dump it, that's basically a linear economy. Linear economy is you take the resource, you use it for producing, and you just, you know, create waste. And that needs to shift. So next slide, please. So when I, when, we looked at the industrial wastewater side of it, especially on the food and beverage side. You know, when, when you look at specifically on the food and beverage, where, which is a huge part of California economy, and just for, I mean, we have to feed seven billion population, right? So it's gotta be food someplace. So if you look at that food and uh, beverage side and the waste that you generate, it's a huge problem. I mean, I'm gonna throw some numbers and examples later on, but it's a big, big, big problem. But what's interesting is there's a huge opportunity in there. The food, food waste care has, has a, about three kilowatt hours of energy trapped in it. So you can do, one way is to put more energy into treating it, or look at that waste as an opportunity and recover energy out of it. And that's what we do. So, next slide, please. <clears throat> So I'm not gonna go into details of this, but food waste is typically treated by bacteria. It's bugs. They, they're, they're phenomenal items. I mean, they're, they're really, really cool. There's a couple different kinds of treatments. One is aerobic where you're pumping air into it and it's like typical ponds that you see in a winery. And anaerobic, anaerobic are these big digesters, you know, food digesters, you see them on uh, dairy plants to a lot of places including the cities as well, so if we keep clicking. So the key differentiation, the reason why they're red and green is, you can keep clicking away, I thought I had the control. So uh, on the right hand side, sorry. If you, so basically one side, you can generate energy, the other side, it requires energy to treat waste. So in an ideal world, what you wanna do is if you can figure out a way to, to use the food waste to recover energy, and use that energy to treat it further, now you can get to very clean water. And that's the whole concept of the closed loop system. Next slide, please. So 
what do I mean by an industrial closed loop or circular solution, right? So in this case, what the idea is, you take the wastewater, you, you use the anaerobic side first. You'll see that, and the, the reactors can help you generate energy from the waste. And while doing so, you're also cleaning the water. So it doesn't clean it 100% of the way, it may clean it about 80, 90% of the way. So, but you're generating a lot of energy out of it. You use that energy and then keep cleaning it later on and you could get back that water for reuse. And I'll give you a like an example of uh, where it's being used right now. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll talk about beer industry, okay? This and the next slide is my example. So if you look at typical beer industry, and we talked about a lot of water usage, a, a pint of beer, and it applies pretty much to wine as well, a glass of wine ha takes about six, seven times as much water to process it. I'm not talking the water that's required to grow the barley or grow the wine, grow the, grow the grapes. I'm talking purely after they get the resources where it's brewed or where it's made, where wine's made. So I'm talking about the actual industrial process side of it, not the agricultural process side of it. So if you look at beer, typical breweries, seven to one ratio. So about 12 and a half percent is beer, the rest is all, you know, stuff. The stuff that you need, stuff like washing tanks, stuff like boilers, stuff like industrial equipment, right? So if you do a really, really, really good job of actually you know, reducing, you know, turn that faucet off, right? Then you get down to four to one. If you turn that faucet down, so there is, there is stuff that you can do. Every small company, small industry, industrial facility can do without putting any big significant capital investment to bring that footprint down. What is your water footprint? We've been asking that in the industry. That's not something generally questioned, but you know, we, as a technology provider, we ask, what is your water to product ratio? You know, not many people know it, and that's where the education part starts. So this is something that is easily achievable without making a lot of changes. But if you really start reusing it, if you click please. So one of the things what we've done and, uh, you know, is to do like a water audit. You need to know, you know, you know where your finances are going, right? I mean, you do your budgets, you do your checkbook balancing, et cetera. Same thing, right? Water audit. Audit your system, audit your situation, and find out where the water is going. And if you put the right technologies in place, one more please. You can bring this down, this ratio down to 2.5 to 1, okay? Where is this happening? Where is this happening? I mean, if you go to the next slide, this is my last slide. Oh, no, this is, this is our technology. It's basically a wastewater treatment in a box. I won't go into the details of the technology, et cetera, so that other speakers have time to talk. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's basically the next generation of uh, organic waste treatment that was Tech actually found uh, supported by NASA, but brought down to earth by our company, and it's being utilized by, if you go to the next slide, Lagunitas. You're gonna, they're sponsors of this event, we're gonna have some beers. Lagunitas guys are actually sp speaking on the other panel right now, and, uh, but if you look at what they've done in Lagunitas, you'll see a layout of the system. It's basically very modular. As the breweries grow, as the wineries grow, you can bring in another box and put it out there. But fundamentally, the numbers are what are compelling. Their water to beer ratio when we're also, it's, there's one portion of the system's been working for about a year now. We are expanding that to cover for the rest of the entire uh, brewery in Petaluma. Right now, they truck their waste to East Bay Mart. Soon, there will be zero trucks on the road from carrying wastewater. That's our goal. And we will get there in the next four months. And you're looking at a water to beer ratio of 2.5 to 1, probably one of the best in the world. Probably the best from a water footprint perspective, in the, if not the best two or best three in the world. And even bigger than the large scale Anheuser Bushes of the world. And what's also cool about it is we're generating biogas and through which we're generating energy. We're generating heat, we're generating 130 kilowatts of power. So we will, all said and done, we will probably have the first 
uh, energy neutral or energy positive wastewater treatment plant. We don't know exactly where we'll land because it's still in the works, but we're generating biogas right now, we're generating energy. So it is, uh, there's opportunity. There's technology that's coming up, a lot of cool new technologies. I think my, the next speaker is gonna touch on something similar but different. Uh, you know, there's cool technology, opportunities there. If you're an industrial customer, you know, it is something you know, we can help with. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Bauji. Our, our last speaker is Mike Cohen. He's a professor of biology at Sonoma State University, and he's been in the Department of Biology since 2005. His research group studies a diverse array of environmental microbes with respect to their association with plants and wastewater treatment applications. And currently, I think he'll be talking about today, he's working with a biological systems unit at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology to develop sustainable systems. Mike? Thank you, Claudia. Let me just do my own quick. Yeah, I'll do this, huh? Yeah, we're, <coughs> or this. There we go. Well, so uh, talking about closed loop systems, uh, whoop. backward. Yeah, there we go. Uh, just to get it started. So if you look on the bottom there, uh, what we were uh, uh, testing, first of all, I want to talk about is a demonstration system we had at the Laguna Wastewater Treatment Plant in Santa Rosa. And you can see there on the, on the bottom right, uh, constructed wetland. And what we were running through there is um, basically treated wastewater. It still has some residual contaminants in it. Some you, you probably all heard about endocrine disruptors, right, the estrogenic activity. Um, that's in there. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so we were testing uh, the removal, for the removal of these residuals uh, in water running through the system, about 5,000 gallons a day, um, and both plants and bacteria doing the work. And so I won't get into the data on that. It worked uh, quite well. I'll show you a little bit. Um, but the, the system generates plant material, and, and one thing that there's a lot of embodying energy in that plant material, right? This is, stores the sun's energy. And one way to extract that energy is to throw it into these anaerobic digests, which you see there with those green monsters. Um, but you can get even more energy out of stuff when you combine multiple types of food, just like a, the analogy with humans, you know, a balanced diet. So these, these mechanical stomachs with bacteria, uh, inside of them, they like a balanced diet. So we were combining, t testing different combinations. One combination had this aquatic biomass, wine lees, the, this um, settled solids from, uh, and liquid from wine production, and crude glycerin from biodiesel production, all in about uh, one to one to one ratio. Um, and that's producing biogas, and uh, as uh, Baiji just uh, said, that that's, equates with power. By the way, this whole thing, is, the, the city kindly uh, Produce this with some grant money we got. Uh, anyone has some children wants a coloring book uh, and crosswords, I'd be happy to give you it. Got a lot of extras. Um, okay, so let's let's go to the the next one. Uh, biogas equals energy. We were uh, taking that biogas, compressing it, just running it through a, a Yamaha generator. I'll be curious to hear how you, uh, you're getting the energy out of the biogas. You know, we'll talk about that later. And uh, there was a charging station at the facility and, and running an um, a, uh, electric vehicle there uh, at the treatment plant off that charging station. Okay. Uh, one thing I just had to mention, uh, and if uh, some advancement were to come out of all this, it's actually the thing that we were doing to use that biogas. Um, now, what, there's a little contaminant in biogas, it's hydrogen sulfide. It makes it very difficult to use uh, for machinery because it corrodes machinery. And so there's, there's a, a nice little system. Uh, we do, it's, it's not uh, unique to us, but uh, it's not well commercialized yet. Uh, it eliminates the, the uh, sulfide. And if you could just, uh, hit that, we've got a little animation. There's these bio balls inside there. And, and what you see, that, that spring, that's uh, from Calistoga. There's sulfide uh, 
oxidizing bacteria in that water. We inoculated these bio balls with that water, the bacteria glommed on, and then we just run the biogas from the bottom, these just basically these uh, pickle containers uh, with a perforated bottom there, and uh, run the biogas from the anaerobic digesters through there, go through the top, and, and if you hit that one more time, that we're misting it with basically the treated wastewater, which has a little a nitrate in it. Hit it again. Nitrate is used just like we use oxygen. Um, you think about it, when, when we eat something, uh, you know, like a, a donut, we have sugar, we take the electrons off the sugar and we put it onto oxygen. That's basically what we're doing. We're oxidizing the sugar. These guys, these bacteria, they're taking the electrons from hydrogen sulfide and they're depositing it onto this nitrate, which is in the water. So you, you don't have to use any oxygen into the biogas. And basically clean the biogas and um, lowering it to a level that's uh, really not detectable. And, and this is actually a little sales for anyone here from the wastewater treatment plant. I would highly recommend this. Right now they're using these uh, wood chips that are impregnated with iron, and that has to be emptied out every few months, and it's a big mess. So, um, all right, if we can move ahead. Well, digression on using biogas. Uh, this just completes the system, I'm talking about the closed loop here. So the digesters, they eliminate about, well, half to two-thirds of the solids get converted to, to gas, the biogas. The, you have some solids that remain. Uh, these are vertical flow digesters, so they, that kind of settles out. We were using that as a, a compost, um, did vermicomposting on that, and used that for strawberry gardens we had out there. And, and at the opening event, you'll recall we had some good strawberries, right, good harvest. And um, of course, there's a, a liquid that comes from that. By the way, the, uh, the irrigation um, of, of the strawberry field is basically from the constructed wetland removing uh, that, that was cleaned up. The liquid from the digesters, if we hit that, that um, I just put here the, the air bubbles just to emphasize, as Bob suggested, about aeration costing so much money. Uh, expensive to do that, to, to, to either lift water, to, to disperse it, to get air into it, or to bubble it. Very expensive. More than half of wastewater treatment cost is usually for aeration. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, the slide that you had, it's basically uh, just a little bit more on mechanism. Um, these uh, micro microbial fuel cells, basically what, similar to what the EcoVolt is, um, there's bacteria on there. And just as I was saying, like those bacteria that we were talking about just took sulfide, the electrons off of sulfide, and, and, and put them onto the nitrate or we take electrons off of sugar and put it on oxygen. These guys, they take uh, the electrons off of these organics, sugars, other things, of, uh, and instead of putting it onto another chemical, they put it onto a surface, and that surface, that's basically an anode of a battery. The electrons flow externally to a place where uh, you can have oxygen uh, receive the electrons and just gets reduced to water. And those, these are really uh, cool bacteria. There's several ways that they do this, um, but you can see some of them have these nanowires. Down to one minute, all right. Um, okay, so uh, we, we are just, uh, you know, developing much smaller scale systems. Like uh, Baji just said that uh, about 10,000 gallons per day is around where you want to be on, on yours. The smallest. Smallest, yeah, and, and we're working with the winery uh, Vintner Square um, uh, let's go, this is what the, our design looks like, much smaller. Um, it's, the, the system's um, been tested on uh, sake distillery, um, scotch distillery, wastewater. If we could just move uh, on this. Uh, you can see similar removal efficiencies of what Bajis was just saying. Keep in mind, this is water coming out of an anaerobic digester. Very low energy production, but on a much larger scale, that adds up to something. Um, if we keep going there. Uh, this is just a system at the distillery in uh, Okinawa at the Awamori Sake. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, once again, what they're showing here is that uh, you can use these systems to, to lower uh, organics to a level that's safe for removal. The, the target here is the, on this number, BOD of 60. And you can see that over the course of the year 2014, this system was able to, to get it down to that level for discharge. Um, this is a Vintner Square in Santa Rosa. Click it one more time. We're, we're, we're testing a microbial fuel cell there. Um, advanced. Uh, um, well, a little, and this is more of this. We're stabilizing the pH uh, basically with the anaerobic digestion. Very, um, go ahead. 
it just shows that uh, anaerobic digestion low, uh, uh, raises the pH, make it suitable for microbial fuel cells. Move ahead. Uh, it was working well, and, and you know we're still doing. We're at the research level, you know, set, working with um, university. You're able to f to fail without anyone losing their job. Um, but you know, I was I was away in Okinawa, and it was running, and it developed a clog during the. We can click it one more time. I, I understand you had a really cold uh, period right before New Year's, and um, yeah, we it's a little thing you don't anticipate. If we had just made the diameter about another quarter inch, we would have not had this problem. It, it clogged in. We're going to re-inoculate. Uh, we'll get uh, some inoculum from the kind people at uh, CME Winery. Um, uh, move ahead. We have a little wetland at this thing, which is following on our results. Uh, one more slide. I just want to show you quick data. This shows you the, the results from the project we had with the city of Santa Rosa at the treatment plant, uh, how wetlands on a one-day retention time can lower levels of uh, estrogenic compounds, mostly birth control pills that get put into the wastewater, two levels that or, or don't stimulate the, the estrogenic except re receptors of the uh, fish. Okay, and then we'll, I think the next one, we're just going to move on to acknowledgments. Uh, this began uh, with the kind people over at the city of Santa Rosa. Some are not still around, uh, but uh, uh, too many people to name here. But we are working with um, Vintner Square, D D Radar Gentio, uh, helping us out a lot by giving us a place to work and all the wastewater we can use. I just want to say, there, they're generating less than 10,000 gallons a year, whereas the kind of scale you're working on is 10,000 gallons a day. So there's uh, different kind of niches uh, in, in which to work. Okay, thank you for your attention. Sorry I went long. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes, right, to the end of the session. And um, I'd like to open it up for questions for any of our speakers. Is there a mic that's available for the questions? Great. Uh, I'd like to know if any of you um, know of the plant vetiver, and if you have worked with that as a water purifier. Have, have any of you heard of it or worked with it at all? I, I strongly encourage you to look at this plant, vetiver. It has a root system that goes 12 feet deep, so it can act as a soil erosion prevention. It can decontaminate both land and water. Um, it cleans up heavy metals, E. coli, um, what's another common water bacteria? It, it can clean up the bacteria, the, um, the fertilizers that you were mentioning. I mean, it does all of those things. It's being used in different countries around the world. And I mean, I've even been thinking about it for the contaminated wells I just read about in Rohnert Park, contaminated rivers, like you can grow it along the shores and um, it has all kinds of benefits. So I really encourage you guys to, to uh, look at vetiver. V-E-T-I-V-E-R. Pardon? Is it like a reed type plant? It has a, it's a grass that, so the root goes 12 feet and the grass grows up like five feet. I mean, it can, the, 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 the um, livestock can feed off of it. And um, there's tons of advantages to it. And I don't think it's known in America very well. I think it's a huge market waiting to happen. It takes, it cleans the air from the carbon. Someone said if you plant 4 billion vet vetiver plants, we wouldn't have a global warming crisis. So get busy. <laughs> Start planting, everybody. Any other questions? Um, I understand. I understand you guys are mostly into the chemical aspect, but um, as we continue with this water drought and our water tables deplete, how is that going to affect the shifting tectonic plates? <laughs> you guys don't want that one. Um, is that? It's not on. Uh, do we have these mics on? Okay. We can. Okay. Um, so um, it's uh, the relationship between tectonics and our and our groundwater aquifers is uh, is probably a little more the the opposite and uh, in that for example in that Napa earthquake that we had um, a year and a half ago we actually saw a pretty dramatic response in, in some of our in some of our water wells that we were monitoring in some areas groundwater levels uh, dropped right when the earthquake hit in some in some areas it rose. Creeks started flowing that hadn't been flowing that year during a, a period of drought, and it was, it was some really interesting um, data. I wish I had more time to, to examine, but uh, so we see that in terms of um, groundwater um, levels affecting 
you, you could potentially have changes along a fault zone. Fault zones um, uh, can get lubricated by groundwater, so if, if there's a change to that, it could potentially impact um, fault zones, but it's not something that, that's really common. And, and the scale of, of how our tectonic plates move is so large that any localized groundwater um, fluctua fl changes are unlikely to, uh, to affect the, the movement of tectonic plates. There's some questions over here. I, I feel like I'm an elementary school student asking this question, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I want one of those coloring books too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I wonder um, when you have um, like Colorado's just gotten a lot of, of moisture. I was just in there. I was just in Colorado, and I was thinking, well. When you have one state like Colorado, and it's got the Colorado River and it flows to California, does it really help with the water supply in California? And um, how are we transporting water? That's my first question. And then the second question is, um, I've always wondered, what happens to water? It goes into the water treatment plants, but then where does it go? So to your, uh, the first question, um, here in, in Sonoma County, we're, we're um, you know, pretty um, distant from, you know, the Colorado River or even the Sacramento River. We're, we're fortunate enough to have a, a pretty good uh, local, you know, water supply that we need to continue to work on, on better managing in the Russian River and our local groundwater supplies that, that, that have, you know, got us to this point and, and will likely you know, if we if we do some of these projects and and better manage um, our our water supply system responsibly, we'll, we'll get us pretty pretty far into the into the foreseeable future. Um, you know, the Colorado River it does affect. You know, Southern California uses the Colorado River, um, San Diego area, Los Angeles area. So those areas are definitely influenced by by what happens in in other in other states and as well as other areas you know in, in California for example the Central Valley relies on water that comes from the Delta so there are those connections but here in Sonoma County we're a little more isolated from from those from those uh, other larger statewide um, areas and then your uh, your other question as far as where does water go after it goes to the treatment plant you know, it, it kind of depends a little bit on the treatment plan and the time of year. Historically, after water was treated, it was generally released into the nearest, you know, river or San Pablo Bay in the case of Sonoma Valley. Um, there's been, you know, further restrictions on, on those releases due to, you know, potential water quality impairments to those water bodies. And so the, um, you know, for the city of Santa Rosa, they've gone through a program where they're actually sending a lot of water up to the geyser steam field to recharge uh, the steam fields up there to generate geothermal energy. Um, and then they're also treating the water such that it could be applied as either landscape irrigation or being used to irrigate um, vineyards. It's actually uh, probably a, um, gonna be a real key source of supply for us in Sonoma Valley to help uh, mitigate those declining groundwater levels because where those declining groundwater levels are occurring are not too far from the treatment plant and we've already seen um, how some of those deliveries to, to the, the vineyards there have, have reduced the amount of groundwater pumping and ground brought groundwater levels up in some areas and hopefully that can be expanded and, and uh, help solve that problem. At the treatment plants, yeah, you guys yeah, probably know better. Yeah. probably both. There's some like mechanical means to separate out solids, et cetera. There's biological treatments. There is reverse osmosis. There is all kinds of technologies going to it. But you know, going back to what happens to that water, it's just there. I mean, there is no new water that's being created, right? Every drop of water is used someplace. The example I usually give is, you know, we have this whole toilet to tap and we cringe about it, whatnot, right? But the example I give is, if you look at city of Minneapolis's wastewater, is city of St. Louis's drinking water. They get it from the same Mississippi River, and their wastewater is city of New Orleans drinking water. And this is not new. This is historically, right? Human civilization lived around a source of water, around a river, and somebody else's, you know, waste becomes somebody else's resource. So this water is there. It's going someplace else, 
right? It's, it's just a shift in balance. No new, I mean, it's a, it's a statement, but you know, in theory, theoretically speaking, there is no added new water that's being created. It's the same as any other resource. You know, you, there's an am amount of rare minerals that we're digging up from the ground. There's a fixed amount. You take it out, where does it go? Waste. That's the whole concept of the take a resource, whatever that is, resource, take it out, use it, waste it, is the whole linear economy I was talking about. And that shift is happening. And, and circular economy is not a new term either. It's been there from, I don't know, 50s, 60s, or at least 70s. But it's finally catching up. World Economic Forum's talking about it. There's a lot of people talking about it. But that water is there. Uh, we have one more minute. Uh, I think there's a question back here. This is a very quick question. I just wanted to know if any of the three of you or four of you know how much water is being used in Sonoma County for the growing of wine grapes. Because we know agriculturally in California that 80% of the use of water used is going to agriculture. Uh, what is the proportion in Sonoma County? Thanks. So the, the studies that, that we've done um, that have looked at that in, in Sonoma Valley and in the, the Santa Rosa Plain um, where we've, we've developed computer models um, to, to develop those estimates because um, as far as groundwater use, the only um, groundwater use that's currently really measured or reported is municipal or public water supply systems. And so we have to estimate the amount of water that's used by, by agriculture and by rural residentials, and we do that by looking at, at uh, land use maps and applying crop functions to, to those. And, so what, we, what we've estimated in, in Sonoma Valley, for example, is of the groundwater use, um, they use roughly um, between 60 to, to 70 percent of the, the total amount of, of groundwater. In the Santa Rosa Plain, um, there, the agricultural use is, is closer to, uh, to 50 percent. And, uh, and that you know, obviously varies year to year of the total, that doesn't include the, the water that's brought in for um, uh, Russian River water, for example, in Sonoma Valley, that's brought in to serve the cities. And so if you look at the total water use in the valley, um, agricultural use is, is less than 50%, but of the groundwater use, it's, it's definitely more. And I will say that as far as uh, uh, the type of, of agricultural use, um, uh, wine grapes generally use a lot less water than than, than other agricultural crops. You know, we, we look at similar studies in the Central Valley where they have almond orchards going in, pistachio orchards, those use you know, on the order of four feet of water per year, whereas wine grapes generally are between um, you know, three to uh, seven or eight inches a, a year on average. See, you thought that was a simple question. <laughs> um, so uh, I need to leave you a few minutes to get to our last session, which is the lessons learned session. So uh, please thank all our panel members for letting us know about new approaches. Thank you.